A lot of political news, a lot of things making headlines and joining us to talk about, well, all the buzz. It's our good friend Scott Braddock, editor, Quorum Report. Scott, how are you today? Doing well, Chad. Good morning. How are you? Doing great. Uh, Normally we visit with Scott, of course, uh, on Mondays, but uh, Scott, you were busy yesterday uh, waiting for a press conference to begin. Well, I, you say busy. I say reporting. Uh, you know, I, I say making sure that I have <laughs> good content for the Chad Hasty show. Yes. On um, yes. Yeah. The, if you've got a Keep Texas Red event uh, coming up in Lubbock, I was at the exact political photo negative of that yesterday. That's right. You um, are. <laughs> uh, you had uh, Royce West, who's a longtime senator, almost 30 years uh, in the state Senate from Dallas. Uh, announce his U.S. Senate bid, and uh, look, a lot of uh, Democrats fired up about them actually having a primary, Chad. I mean, when was the last time they had a statewide primary that got really nasty on the Democratic side? It's We've been a seen while, lots yeah. of them on the Republican side, right? I mean, you know, when you're in firm control of a state, it's easy to have more infighting. Um, the Democrats look to be ascendant, and so they want to have a real primary, which, by the way, could be one of the best things for the Democratic Party, for the health of the party. It's a good idea to have, you know, a rigorous debate about what kind of party you want to be, which is what has happened on the Republican side for years, right? Uh, you know, pragmatism versus ideology and all that sort of stuff. Royce West, uh, who, you know, is, I think, fair to say a little more of a quote-unquote moderate Democrat compared to some of the others who are certainly uh, in the field nationally. Uh, you know, nothing like the squad and nothing like some of the folks who are running for president. Yeah, he's no far, AOC. Far he's just not. Um, and it's interesting that of all of the folks that have announced so far, and, you know, we've got Chris Bell from Houston, former congressman, Amanda Edwards, who's a city councilwoman from Houston who announced as well, who, by the way, in the first uh, day of her campaign, raised two hundred thousand dollars, which is nowhere close to what uh, Cornyn has in the bank. Of course, nine million, but that's a pretty good first day haul, two hundred thousand. So she's one to watch, I think. Um, then you've got M.J. Hager, who ran for Congress last year and now West uh, in this race as well, who has also been a prolific fundraiser, as lots of state senators are. He has two million dollars in the bank, although he can't move that money from his state account over to a federal account. He was talking yesterday. A, a lot about President Trump and not so much about Senator Cornyn. And mm-hmm. I think that gives you a sense of where this race is going to go. Even in 2018, Chad, you, know, you had a lot of folks who were either running for Congress or running for state-level offices uh, who sort of focused on their races. And I think that they uh, really uh, were uh, you know, uh, given some advantage uh, on the Democratic side because of anti-Trump backlash. But I don't remember hearing as much about President Trump from some of those candidates uh, they were more focused on their actual opponents. Uh, the lieutenant governor candidate, for example, Mike Collier, uh, talked more about, uh, you know, Dan Patrick uh, certainly than he did about Trump. Of course, that's a state level race, but a lot of the energy coming from anti Trump backlash. So you thought you might have heard more from Democrats that would be anti Trump. Heard some more of that from West yesterday. And then after West's announcement, uh, Senator Cornyn, more than any of the other candidates, seems to take West a little more seriously. He put out uh, an ad immediately, Cornyn did, uh, you know, calling West a liberal and uh, putting out a website called Royce West Facts, where he talked about uh, West's record in the uh, long record, I should say, in the Texas Senate, but uh, certainly voting, uh, you know, in a more liberal way than uh, this uh, radio show and this audience for sure. Uh, but I think uh, in a way that would probably resonate with a lot of folks in urban Texas and some of those folks uh, who are in the suburban areas as well. You know, Scott, you you, you were talking about this, you know, being a, a competitive primary. Mm-hmm. It, it It's interesting to me there because this probably will be a competitive primary. Mm-hmm. But if you if you're not paying attention to politics, if, if you're not, you know, if you're outside of Dallas, uh, you probably haven't heard of Royce West. Right. If if you're outside of the Round Rock area and where MJ Hager was right now, unless you just man, you're just all in and you're paying attention to politics every single day, you probably don't know MJ Hager. You probably don't know the 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 uh, councilwoman from Houston. I, there's who's the big name in this is basically what I'm asking you because there's not a Julian Castro, there's not a a Beto O'Rourke. Who's the big name? None of these people have a national presence, and in Texas politics, we often say that our state's politics is national politics and vice versa sometimes. You almost have to have a national profile to be somebody that people all around Texas know. I mean, even the Attorney General, Ken Paxton, 
to some degree has a national profile, right? Because he's out suing, uh, you know, it was uh, you know, the attorney general previously when it was Abbott was suing uh, Obama all the time. And now you have uh, the attorney general, Ken Paxton, you know, fighting the fight, so to speak, on um, Obamacare and yeah. uh, the ACA and all that. Um, so our statewide, even to some degree, and Dan Patrick is on Fox News Channel all the time, right? Yeah. So you, you, you have to have almost a national profile to be known across 254 counties and two time zones in a state of about 30 million people. None of the people who are running for U.S. Senate so far on the Democratic side have that sort of national profile. But I'm not sure how much that matters, you know, as far as once they actually have a nominee in place, because I do think, uh, and if you look at uh, the results in 2018 where the Democrats came closer so than, you know, than they have before in, in you know, 25 years to winning a statewide race, so much of that is centered on the presidency. Uh, a midterm election is so often about, almost always about, you know, whether people support or are in opposition to the person who is in the White House, in this case, President Trump. Go back to 2010, and it was President Obama, and you have the Republicans at that time pick up a supermajority in the Texas House, uh, you know, 100 votes, uh, whereas it was almost a tie in the Texas House before that. And it wasn't because, you know, those Republicans who were running for Texas state representative at the time had run such amazing campaigns, uh, you know, in 2010. Um, and by the way, the same thing happened in uh, in Congress, right? You had lots of uh, Republicans uh, winning their races at the congressional level as well. And so much of that was just backlash to President Obama. Uh, and so with President Trump, um, the effect is a little bit different, but I think people do have uh, their opinions about Trump. As you know, they either love him or hate him, and that's kind of baked in. It's the president who is really the one who is uh, converting so many new, uh, new, converting so many people into new voters uh, in the state. You know, for a long time, you know, the joke was that if you're looking for new voters in Texas, there's a name for you as a candidate, and it's called loser. Uh, but in 2018, um, you did see a lot of new Democratic voters, and now the Republicans, of course, are trying to figure out how to find new Republican voters, which yeah. is an interesting twist. Yeah. Uh, it, do you think, and I know it's early on in the process uh, mm -hmm. for the Democrats on this Senate side, who would you label the front runner if there is one? If there is one, I would say that it's Senator West, and here's why. He has the uh, at least tacit support of most of the Democratic members of the Texas legislature. He announced yesterday that he has uh, the support of 10 uh, of his uh, colleagues in the Texas Senate and I think about 50 of the Texas House Democrats. Um, and the reason that's important is because he would have the – potentially, you know, be lining up the endorsements of those people. Um, it's not necessarily a money thing, but all of those folks who have uh, their own political infrastructure in their districts, if they're supporting West, then that means, you know, that they can move voters in his direction. Um, and I had seen where people were chattering about, now, why are all these Democratic legislators who do have war chests and do have their own political organizations, why are they supporting West? over these others, like M.J. Hager or uh, this councilwoman from Houston, well, there's a really easy answer to that. It's that you, you have in West somebody who could potentially be a U.S. senator, and they would like to have, you know, curry favor with him. The other thing is he's not up for re-election next year to the Texas Senate, so if he doesn't win the U.S. Senate race, which I would still uh, handicap it for Cornyn, but say lightning struck and he did go to Washington, uh, you know, that'd be one scenario. But if Cornyn wins, which is likely – then you have West who would come back to the Texas Senate and as a senator has the power to kill almost any piece of legislation because yeah. senators can generally just sit on whatever. Um, and, of course, he would remember which legislators did not support him in his campaign. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that, 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 that's a good, pretty good reason why to support him. Uh, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty good. And, and by the way, that's it's not a vindictive thing. It's just that, you know, these, these folks have long memories, if you will. Absolutely. It's politics. Uh, mm -hmm. Wendy Davis, a, a name, oh, yeah. a blast from the past. Wendy Davis announcing yesterday – uh, that she is indeed running for Congress, uh, this time against Chip Roy. Mm -hmm. And you have her buddying up to the National Democratic Apparatus. Uh, and I say buddying up. I mean, she's, uh, you know, already gotten the endorsement of Kirsten Gillibrand, which I saw that you noted on Twitter. That's huge. Most I mean, I, that is huge. I mean, <laughs> if you want to get to the ranch dressing, you need to get Kirsten Gillibrand to endorse your campaign. 
absolutely. Um, well, that video where the woman was just trying to get some ranch dressing, <laughs> oh, she best wanted. thing ever. Her, you know, it has the support of Nancy Pelosi and the Democratic leadership, Wendy Davis does, and she'll have national money for that race. Interesting, um, you know, Chip Roy is somebody who comes out of the Ted Cruz camp of the Republican Party. Of course, he used to work with and for Cruz, uh, one of the more conservative members. And even two cycles ago, you had even a cycle ago, uh, you know, before 2018, the district that Chip Roy represents is the district that Lamar Smith used to hold in Congress. And there are people from that area, Chad, from that San Antonio stretch up to Austin district. There are people who that's been their congressman or that had been their congressman, Lamar Smith, for their entire lives, uh, you know, I mean, yeah. decades in, in the U.S. House. It's been rock-solid Republican. But like some of these other districts that are uh, in suburban Texas, uh, they changed dramatically in 2018, uh, Chip Roy just winning that race by the skin of his teeth. I mean, he was just over 50 percent with three people in the race. And so that's one of the uh, districts that Democrats are going to be targeting and one of the ones that they think they can take. And they do have good reason for that. I mean, not only did the numbers shift, but you also see a shift in the rhetoric from those congressmen. Uh, Chip Roy is one of only three Republicans from Texas in the U.S. House to condemn the comments from President Trump about, uh, you know, saying that the squad ought to go back to where they came from. Right. Uh, Chip Roy, and uh, you also had uh, uh, Pete Olson from the Houston area, from Fort Bend County, and um, you had uh, one other as well, uh, uh, well heard from the border, who said, "Look, this is completely unacceptable." And there's a political reason for that, right? They're not just doing that because because that's the way they feel, even though they may. Um, but with most Republicans in the House, remember, you have a lot of them who either uh, agree with the president or just didn't say anything, right. right? And that's because the polling shows in Texas and the polling around the nation is, <clears throat> and President Trump has you know, pointed this out many times, among Republican voters, he's just so rock solid. I mean, he's above 85% in, in most places with Republican voters. He's as high as 90% in some places, uh, especially in Texas. Uh, and so if the president says something that makes Republicans uncomfortable, usually their move is to just say nothing. It's very telling that Chip Roy and others uh, were, you know, quick out there to say, no, the president was wrong to say that. Now, if you look at Wendy Davis and her record, um, she is known as, you know, somebody who's pretty liberal. You know, she, I mean, immediately uh, Royce West was attacked uh, by Cornyn for standing with Wendy Davis when she filibustered the abortion restrictions back in 2013. Uh, interesting uh, career uh, with Wendy because, you know, when she was on the Fort Worth City Council, and I know her going all the way back to back then, she was more of a moderate, uh, you know, Democrat who you know, could have been mistaken for a Republican, honestly, in Fort Worth. Uh, she went to the Texas Senate and, of course, says things became become uh, more colored by national politics, you see that uh, folks you know, get into their partisan groove, and uh, she was certainly perceived as more liberal. So I'm sure you're going to see the abortion Barbie uh, stickers and you know memes online, that sort of thing. You know, as Chip Roy tries to beat her, that's going to be definitely a race to watch. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. For the Democrats, and, and you've seen this comment pop up every now and then, it really started with Beto O'Rourke, uh, and, and for the Texas Democrats, and they're running a lot of people who have lost previously. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether it's MJ Hager, whether it's Wendy Davis, uh, you know, Beto O'Rourke, is, is this, does this mean they don't have a deep bench necessarily on, on you know, for some of these statewide races uh, or, you know, the congressional races, or is it just, well, enough time has passed, you know, in, in the case of Wendy Davis, why not give it another shot and see what happens? Yeah, you know, there's always been two theories about this. Uh, you know, on the one hand, for years you had Democrats who would run statewide in Texas, and they would of course lose, and then that would be the end of their career. Um, and you have had those within the Democratic Party who have said that you know maybe what they need to do because running for statewide office in Texas is so difficult because of its size and the expense that's involved uh, that they should run more than once. Um, you know, to introduce themselves in one campaign and then just keep it going. And by the way. As we've talked about many times on the show, it used to be that there was more of a governing time and then a campaign time, and now they just there's no daylight between them. Right? This is always campaigning. I mean, every everything about the president uh, right now, uh, all the coverage that you see online and uh, on cable news, every, every single discussion is through the lens of his reelection effort. Yeah. Right? Uh, everything's about the campaigns, um, and so it's 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 not just 
you know, going with somebody who lost before, but it's, it's, you know, figuring out which candidates uh, have actually, you know, got some muscle memory for how to do this. And it is interesting that Republicans right out of the gate, uh, whether it's Cornyn or Chip Roy or whoever, immediately revert to the rhetoric of, you know, this person is too liberal for Texas. This person is, you know, far to the left and all that. Those things have worked previously in Texas and they may work again. But I think when you look at the trends in this state, and the way that the numbers have been moving, that those arguments may not work in certain pockets of the state anymore. Uh, and so we'll see what happens, especially in these three uh, congressional races that I mentioned. Yeah. All right, Scott, uh, tell folks what they can find over at Quorum Report. You can see everything that's going on with all these uh, campaigns. We've got uh, in-depth analysis and more for you at quorumreport.com. You can also sign up for our free emails there at quorumreport.com. Yeah, absolutely. Scott, appreciate your time. And uh, let's see, I'll be out the first part of next week. Maybe we'll catch up at the end of next week. Sounds great. Thanks, Chad. All right. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. That's Scott Braddock. Follow him on Twitter at Scott Braddock.